Welcome to the Asbestos Knowledge Empire. What does asbestos management mean to you? I used to really struggle with the asbestos management at my site, but now it's a breeze. It used to be really expensive. I was paying loads, but now I've got my asbestos power team in place. It's so much easier. Asbestos could be a pain in the ass if not handled right. We had to stop the job because asbestos was discovered. Now we don't have that problem. Asbestos management is easier than you think. Asbestos management. Be proactive, not reactive. Think about asbestos first, not last. And now your hosts, best-selling authors and asbestos experts, Ian Stone and Neil Munro. Welcome to the Asbestos Knowledge Empire. I'm Ian Stone. I'm Neil Munro. So today we're going to talk about asbestos and encapsulating asbestos materials. So we had a bit of a situation with one of our clients and they're looking to encapsulate some external asbestos. So it's asbestos insulating board soffits. And the question they kind of raised was, what do they have to encapsulate those materials with? So in their minds, they'd heard about the different materials, the different products that were on the market for encapsulating materials. So they adamant that it had to be ET150, which is, and we'll explain, uh, go into a bit more detail of exactly what it is, but it's a product that's commonly used to encapsulate asbestos materials within the asbestos industry. Um, so the external asbestos insulating board soffits, client got fixated in their minds that it had to be two coats of ET150. That's a, an okay material to use, but it sort of brought into question how long would that actually last on the external of the property because it's actually not an external product no and it would face with it being on the outside below the roof and there's gutters that sort of sit above the soffits so that it's going to be you know weathered and susceptible to a lot of rain and wind etc on the outside of the building and they've already previously done quite a lot of these encapsulating works throughout this property well, what would they use there is evidence that no, the ET150 that they have previously used right, okay. has weathered, has started to peel, has started to bubble. Which that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Because, like you say, like the ET150, it's an elastomeric sealant. It dries with like a rubberized finish. So that's kind of our go to as an industry. It's a perfect product for stuff inside. Yeah, stuff inside. So, all the walls. Like, yeah, walls, especially insulated board ceilings, yeah. walls, paneling, fire breaks. But like you say, it's not an external paint. It's no, not an exterior paint. It you know, it's perfect inside because it doesn't get any weathering, doesn't get any rain on it, gives it some impact protection, doesn't peel when it's dry. You mm. know, it, it can take a bit of vapour. So, you know, in boiler rooms where there's a bit of steam, yeah, it's okay for that. But, you know, when we're talking about wind, rain, hail, snow, temperatures constantly going up and down, you know, below freezing... Yeah, but in their mind, they've just heard the term ET150, so that's that. the asbestos paint. Yes. It's got okay. to be that because that's what you use for asbestos. Yeah, okay. And it's all brought about a big question is... Well, what, what can you actually use? What can you actually use and do you have to use that? Yeah, okay. We've got a few that we're going to run through of different ones that you can use and can be used. And it's kind of horses for courses. It's different products are better for different things. Yeah. We actually scanned, had a quick scan through the regs, didn't we? Yeah. And even the asbestos contractor's guide Yep. as well, there's no specification. No, the only thing that kind of mentioned was in Essentials where it talks about a non... Yeah, asbestos essential, there's a task sheet for encapsulating asbestos cement and it just said a low solvent. That's it. Low, low solvent, solvent paint. Yeah. which that's kind of a standard practice anyway because yeah, that's a nondescript <laughs> that's coming at it from the health and safety point of view of high solvent paints are give, more dangerous to your health more risk of being more flammable yeah. etc yeah so yeah there are different things you can use you can use normal house paints let's start at kind of the, the lower end of the scale yeah, emulsion yeah a bit of emulsion slap it on there yeah it will cover it it will seal it in exactly the same way the thing with kind of standard paints is you'll get a better finish yeah. That, yeah. than you would. That's the only thing with... Pick the colour you want. Yeah, pick the colour you want. <laughs> yeah, get ET150, it comes in white, grey. Dark grey. Dark grey, <laughs> yeah. And then you're into the realms of, like, chucking other colours in to yeah. mix with it, which it's never ideal. Yeah, with emulsion, obviously, it's quite thin, so particularly if you're encapsulating a, a friable material, wouldn't it take quite a few coats, I'd say, to mm. actually get a decent seal on it? Even if you're spraying it, it would. Yeah. Whether you're spraying it or painting it with, like, brushes or rollers, it, it definitely... You need a good few coats, probably, just to actually seal it. In particular, like, A or B, where you have actually got fibres... Yeah. 
you know, sticking out of the material. You think of like when you do any decorating in your house, like any, when you painted, I mean, it's brilliant. One coat makes me laugh every time. One yeah. coat, well, yeah, always needs two coats, so doesn't it? Mm. <laughs> you ever use the pink stuff? You paint it pink, no, never you paint it that. pink and it goes white. I've used that. Again, you still need more and you still miss bits. That might be just me because I'm a <laughs> crap at decorating. DIY special. <laughs> yeah, so... You can use those. Right, now the downside of using the emulsion, like I said, the upside is you get a better finish and you get the colour you want. The downside is, is that there's no kind of impact protection there. No. That's the problem. And that's why when you ratchet it upon the next one on the scale is the ET150. Yeah, and particularly I suppose it depends on what kind of emulsion. So like standard emulsion, you can wipe that off with a cloth quite easily. Mm. So, you know, it's not really going to give you any protection other than it might just stick the fibres down to the material a bit yeah. better than it being unsealed. Obviously, if you have got like one of those wipe clean ones or something that's a bit more... Yeah, like the satin finish or whatever. Again, yeah, that gives you a little a bit, bit stronger, more... Yeah. a bit of a stronger finish. Yeah. But yeah, but when you compare that, like I say, to the next one on the list, which is ET150, that is where it comes into its own. And that's why, as an industry, we use it a lot. It's a thick paint, it Compared dries... Compared to emulsion, you know, yeah. if you're looking at a type of emulsion, a type of ET150. ET150 looks more like paste, doesn't yes. it? It's, yeah, it it's does. a real thick sort of paint. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic and it does the job great. Like we said earlier, you can encapsulate boiler room walls, ceilings, paint big panels of asbestos insulating board, paint pipe work with it, whatever. And it goes on nice and thick. It yep. covers really well. Once it's dry, it does give a little bit of impact protection because it's got that kind of rubberized finish. The only thing I would say, you're not going to get a decorator's finish. That's exactly you know? where I was going with that, yeah. yeah. The finish, it's never mint. Yeah, <laughs> it's sealed. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It, and there's a difference job between like painting uh, Painting for aesthetics and painting for sealing the asbestos. Yeah. And even if you got a painter and decorator in who was asbestos trained to yeah. do that, you're still not going to get the finish that you would with normal stuff. Yeah. How many contracts have you had to say, not a decorator, mate? Yeah. <laughs> Every single one. That's a classic line. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the only problem or the only downside. But I mean, most of the time when it is boiler rooms, back of house, all the rest of it, as long as it looks half decent and yeah. it is sealing <clears throat> the area. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can get a good finish. It doesn't always have to look like a dog's dinner. I was going to say, like, with big areas where contractors have um, spray applied it, which involves watering the, the material down so it can be sprayable, but they have to do a few more coats, you know. Two coats is usually not enough, so they end up doing three or four coats to get that protection yeah. layer. Uh, but, but it is a better finish. It's a smoother finish. It's a smoother finish. Whereas you, if you hand brushing it on, you get extra on, so you end up with a, a thicker layer, but it does look a bit rough. Yeah. So something to bear in mind if you're encapsulating asbestos materials within somewhere where you want to look pretty. Yeah, if you think about like, I don't know, the entrance to a building yeah, or a exactly. reception area or something, yeah, then... Yeah, potentially not going to have a nice finish on that. No. Not if they can't spray it, at least. Yeah. But that said, like I say, that, that is the standard go-to within our industry for those reasons. Yeah. But, like we said, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. No. So the next one down on the list is like a penetrating encapsulant. See, these kind of, again, they soak into the material more. They give an even more of a protection because they kind of soak up into it and yeah. therefore that protection factor... Becomes a layer part of the layer. Of yeah, the it becomes material. like a layer on the outside itself. And it's really good for like more friable asbestos types, really. Yeah, there's a few on the market. But again, that's all on the application process as well and that being applied correctly and having the correct amount of layers yeah. building up on the material. And experience. Yeah. Because when you're working with these materials, I mean, like we say, anybody can paint a wall, right? So yeah, fine. But using emulsion, that's fine. Using ET150, that's fine. When you start using the penetrating capsulants, you need to know how much of a layer you're putting on, how long you're leaving it, how many coats you're giving it, the gaps and times in between, because that can all affect it. Because the last thing you want to do is encapsulate the substrate and then that causes damage to the actual asbestos. Yeah, and there's obviously there's a cost difference between those and you know the ET150 as well. Yeah, so that's something to bear in mind. And if you are encapsulating a lot of asbestos materials, that's going to increase. You know, it's going to have a multiple to that. And then there's another one as well, which is water-based epoxy resins. Now they're available kind of either as a resin finish itself, so where it's kind of like the penetrating encapsulant, it will finish over the material and usually give like a cloudy or a clear finish. Yeah. But also you can get them where you use like a chopped strand mat that goes into the mix as well. And again, that gives you a real high impact and high protection that's kind of 
it becomes easier to use, easier to manage, it's cleanable. Yeah, it kind of gives it a cleanable surface, doesn't yeah. it, afterwards. But again, that even more so than the penetrating ones, that's an even more difficult material to use and to get the right finish on. Yeah, paint-wise, yeah. So that's, that's kind of covering the actual encapsulating materials, but if you wanted to go to the next level, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that's sort of adding sort of mechanical encapsulation, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, you can actually build something around the materials. Exactly that. I mean, and that could be anything. It doesn't have to be painted to be encapsulated. It could be, right? it could be boxed um, in with plasterboard or, yeah. you know, anything. Yeah. Aluminium casings yeah. or. I've seen all sorts over the years, like boarding directly applied on, yeah. like Superlux, stuff like that. Like you said, uh, yeah, overboarding, like. ALB, yeah. space insulating board. Ply board in the boxing out, plaster board in and around it, metal sheeting put directly over it, like panels put straight over it. Yeah, tin going around pipes, even wrapping with kind of fiberglass and calico, wrapping them up. Again, this is all form of encapsulation. Yeah, again, going back to our what I was talking about at the beginning, the asbestos insulating board soffits, a more permanent solution for that could have been, you know, overcladding it with PVC. Um, and that probably would last, you know, that lasts for years. Yeah. 20, 30 years probably for, you know, encased material itself. So mm. encapsulation, okay, there's just a few examples, but if you want some real sort of protection, is to go to mechanical protection, really. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That is the longevity. Yeah, it gives you, and like I said earlier, it's horses for courses, so it depends on what you're doing and what area it's in and yeah. what you need it to do. How um, long you want it to last and how yeah. much you want to spend. Yeah, exactly that. You know, if it's a building that you know in the future is going to be refurbed or you may be demolished, etc., you're probably not going to want to spend loads protecting the material. No. you just got to sort of weigh up those. It's kind of the risk versus the need yeah. versus what's actually the yeah. lifetime of that. Exactly. And with that example, I'll be, you know, especially insulating board soffits on the external, up high level, you don't really need any impact protection. No. Uh, and also with that, I mean, like you said, they were really hung up on the idea of it's got to be ET150. Yes. Well, it doesn't. I mean, there's no. plenty of external... Yeah, external masonry paint yeah. would have probably been a better solution. Yeah. You could even go, you know, a layer of coating of ET150 to give it that impact protection mm. and the uh, asbestos protection and then maybe overcoating it with uh, external masonry to give it that weatherproofing. And that's the key there, like the point is, like you said, it, like it had bubbled because it had been getting water damaged and all the rest of it, well, ET150 is not going to stop that happening. No, the only no. thing that's going to stop that from happening is weather protecting it. Yeah. And sometimes it is, sometimes you have got to look at, is there another reason for that? And it might have been that water can ingress from you know, only needs a small crack somewhere or could have been the fascias that were actually letting water through. So water is getting in behind the soffits, soaking water. through, <laughs> soaking, yeah, soaking through the soffit. So it's actually coming from on top yeah. as opposed to from underneath. Well, as, as I know, my house recently, I've had a leak and uh, it came in from, oh, well, I still don't even know, it just came in. It found its way in. Yeah. And that's the problem with water, it does. Yeah, it will find its course, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. Path of least resistance. That's it, definitely. <laughs> I hope you found that one interesting. You've learned a bit about encapsulation and the fact that, yes, ET150 is the kind of go standard to. industry yeah. go-to, but it's not necessarily the required one. You should just choose the best encapsulation for the job and what's going to be better in the long run. That's it. I think the important thing is to make sure that whatever you do use it is adequate for what you need it to. Yeah, it's got to be fit for purpose. Fit for purpose. It's no point cutting costs because um, you might have to end up spending more on your mind. Definitely. Yep, so that's this for now. Uh, remember, it's best is first, not last. <laughs>